listening to a podcast from digitaloilandgas.com. This podcast is entitled, China Leads the World in the Drive to Green Transportation. Has China co-opted Elon Musk's vision for an emissions-free transportation future? It certainly looks like it, and there are big implications for the global oil industry. Now, I'm a great admirer of Elon Musk's grand scheme to overall the transportation sector. It's a seriously bold move, and he's making progress on all fronts. His first and most prominent asset is the sexy auto venture that is now building up manufacturing capacity to 500,000 cars a year for his latest design, the Model 3, an electric car for the well-to-do masses. And by well-to-do, that's because it's uh, US uh, $35,000 to purchase, and you really do need a 240-volt power line to your garage to feed the batteries, which is another 5K. Next is the enormous battery plant being built outside Reno, Nevada, that will make the batteries for the vehicles. Batteries are a key element in his formula because it's the batteries that displace petroleum. And to capture solar energy for the vehicles, he has yet another critical asset in the mix, a solar panel company that makes beautiful roofing tiles that are also solar energy collectors. In the U.S., roofs get replaced on average every 10 years, and perhaps more frequently in those places visited annually by tornadoes, hurricanes, fires, and other violent weather. That's plenty of time to build up manufacturing capacity to match electric vehicle demand. And finally, Tesla offers the Powerwall product line, a household and commercial battery set that store up solar power generated in the day, or grid power when the sun doesn't shine, for recharging your electric vehicles and for powering your other needs in the evening. There are lots of skeptics writing about how the Powerwall doesn't have enough capacity, or how not enough roofs are oriented properly for maximum solar collection, or how inefficient the tiles are, or how the Tesla doesn't have enough range. But just five big household appliances, the fridge, the stove, the dishwasher, dryer, and oven, account for the majority of household energy consumption, and they continue to become very energy efficient. And solar panels have dropped in price while gaining in efficiency too. And finally, even the Tesla vehicle has tremendous range with creative energy management. What the Western press doesn't realize is how China Inc. has copied this formula and now sets the pace for adoption of emissions-free transportation. The IEA reports that the worldwide fleet of electric cars reached 2 million in 2016. Some 40% of new car purchases were from car companies whose names we struggle to pronounce and don't really hear about in the West because they're not exported and they don't advertise on Hockey Night in Canada. While Tesla is just ramping up production, China is already ahead. With vehicle ownership in China much below that of North America, first-time car buyers are likely to buy electric cars. Driver expectations and behaviors will be set by the unique features of electric transportation, whereas Western expectations for electric vehicles have been set by the incumbents, that is, the petroleum cars. Next, the batteries. China's planning, uh, central planning team has encouraged its industry to get into the battery business. The largest battery firms today may be Japanese, those masters of consumer electronics, but the Chinese are adding capacity as a matter of national strategic importance. As for renewable energy, China as a nation adds one soccer field of solar panels, that is 75 yards by 115 yards, or 77,620 square feet, every hour. Compare this to the average house roof area in the U.S. of 1,500 square feet, and Tesla needs to convert 51 house roofs every hour to keep pace, and that's about 450,000 roofs per year, a pretty tall order. China also installs one big wind turbine every hour, or about 8,700 per year. For reference, a typical wind turbine of about 1.5 megawatt hours output and a 30% capacity rating provides enough power for 330 houses in the West. That's about 8 million houses in total. So while critics take their shots at Mr. Musk, the Chinese seem to have concluded that his vision is spot on and are now well ahead on all fronts, vehicles, batteries, and renewable energy. And China does not let the market solely make strategic decisions about such important topics as emissions, energy, and transportation. As they begin to see the positive impacts, my bet is that they double down, as has been suggested in a few news stories. Unfortunately, the West does not yet fear Chinese efforts in digital. The top five largest digital companies by market cap are American, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook. Despite the success stories of Alibaba, Tencent, and WeChat, The West also seems unfazed by the Chinese on industrial matters, despite the success of companies like Huawei in trouncing the world of telecom switches, 
the rise of the world's largest solar panel producer and one of the biggest manufacturers of wind turbines. So what happens to the global oil sector as China transitions to an emissions-free transportation sector? Let's consider demand. China has accounted for the bulk of recent demand growth in oil as both the largest and the fastest growing economy on the planet. With fewer internal combustion engines in their market, growth in oil demand will have to rely on other markets. But which ones? India has also signaled its intent to move away from petroleum engines. Africa is a large and untapped market, but highly fragmented and lacking infrastructure. <clears throat> Therefore, demand should plateau and fall as more electric drivetrains displace petrol. As another observation, 13% of global oil demand is used by the oil industry. Reduce the demand for oil in transportation, and you'll also reduce the demand for oil for oil, that is, compounding the fall in demand. How about the supply of oil? Well, digital advancements are actually unlocking more oil reserves as digital helps improve the low recovery rates of unconventional resources. The U.S., with its abundant shale deposits and hyperkinetic oil sector, will continue to produce the marginal barrel, but at ever-declining cost. The risk profile of oil assets may well change from a high-risk, high-reward asset class to a lower-risk, longer-life asset class. Higher-cost barrels will be priced out of the market permanently, stranding those reserves. And how about the basis of the oil price? China and Russia are both keen to trade oil on some currency other than the U.S. dollar, and rapidly shifting markets create the conditions for change. For example, a number of trials for trading oil using digital technologies, like blockchain, create an opening for oil pricing using a non-sovereign cryptocurrency. Power trading is also experimenting with blockchain, as is LNG trading, and LNG is a key fuel for power generation, something that might fuel electric cars. It's not inconceivable to project how energy markets transition to a neutral currency for trading in such energy commodities as power, oil, renewables, and gas. And how about oil infrastructure? Well, as demand for oil shifts around, long-life investments in oil midstream, that is, pipelines, ports, terminals, and ships, becomes harder to de-risk. For example, as China transitions to an electric transportation network, what is the outlook for expanding Canadian oil pipelines and terminals to satisfy what looks like a capped and possibly declining Asian market? A number of markets retain strategic petroleum reserves that provide a buffer for supply interruption. IEA guidelines are to have 90 days supply onshore, but with demand for oil looking like it may decline, those petroleum reserves could well be too large. Big, long positions may no longer be economically sensible. What about other oil investments? Well, the global power grid will need to transform to accommodate renewable power generation, household and commercial batteries, and on-the-move power represented by electric cars. Power assets have historically been the dominant asset class for those seeking long life and low risk, and will now compete more directly for investment dollars with oil. Next is, and finally, geopolitics. China's efforts to build islands on coral reef outcroppings in the South China Sea are unlawful, according to a recent court decision. But one of the reasons for a larger presence has been to secure access to potential oil and gas reserves in the area, which may no longer be needed. The U.S. may not feel the need to militarily oppose Chinese efforts in nation building in the absence of an oil-driven justification. In the famous movie called China Syndrome, a California nuclear reactor nearly melts down, and journalists discover what is possibly a cover-up of the true situation. China Syndrome, therefore, refers to the possibility of a nuclear reactor meltdown penetrating the Earth's core and traveling through the planet to emerge in China. Well, in my view, it's actually the reverse. China's efforts to transform what will be the world's largest transportation sector could trigger a meltdown of Western efforts to transform the West's own transportation systems. Instead of criticizing Mr. Musk's efforts, Westerners should figure out how to help him and other innovators accelerate the transition. You have been listening to a podcast from digitaloilgas.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to future installments and visit us at digitaloilgas.com.